Finish this statement for me. Behind every good man is a... There you go. A good woman, for those who don't know it. I know that's old school. In fact, I hope I don't offend you. So I'll say it the other way around. Behind every good woman is a... Yeah, it takes two. And in life, we're better together in a lot of ways. And the story today we're looking at is Miriam. We're calling her the first lady of the Exodus because really she's the good woman behind two good men. In Micah 6, 4, we, we find out that Miriam played a vital role. God said Moses and Aaron and Miriam led out Israel from Egypt. And we don't often think of Miriam as playing that vital of a role. She's not mentioned a lot in Exodus, but when you look at the sum total of all she did, she was a vital and an important part of it. And there's some lessons we can learn from Miriam, and that's what we want to do today. She, everything in her life, it was experience of hope and despair. It's a story of terror and deliverance, slavery and freedom, unimportance and prominence. She did some good things in her life that we're going to learn. She also did some not so good things. And we're going to learn from those not so good things too. She's one of those real people in the Bible that help us see how we are to live life and how we need to go through it. And so that's why we're looking at, at Micah 6. <laughs> Four, uh, just to set the stage, last time we were together, we looked at Joseph, and Joseph was some um, 350 years or so since Joseph, there's a new Pharaoh on the throne in Egypt, and that Pharaoh, it said, didn't remember Joseph. Maybe they didn't remember the good things Joseph did, maybe they didn't remember his contributions, but this Pharaoh only saw this group of people that grown from 70 up to hundreds of thousands, and he said, they're too big. If an enemy attacks, they might side with the enemy, and then right here in the middle of us, it, it would they, they'd, they'd rise up against us and join our enemy. And so they decided to stop that by making the Israelites slaves. Until that point, they really hadn't been slaves, but this Pharaoh comes on the scene and said, let's make their life so hard they don't have a shot at helping us, at helping our enemies against us. And that didn't work. Israel kept multiplying. They kept having babies. They kept growing and getting stronger. So Pharaoh said, okay, to the Egyptian midwives, he said this, if a baby's born that's male, throw them in the Nile River. He figured we kill off the males. We'll make it to where they're not strong enough to rise up against us. And that's kind of where the story of Exodus begins and where we see Miriam come on the scene. And we're going to learn some lessons from her life life today. And it's just one verse today we want to start with is Micah 6, verse 4. Micah 6, verse 4. It says there, For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And you can already see on the screen our first lesson is that we need to have faith. Miriam is an example of someone with great faith. Uh, the, the story is we set the scene there. Exodus starts and Moses is born. And Moses' parents didn't, like no parent would want to throw their baby in the river. Moses' parents didn't want to do that, so they hid Moses for several months. And then finally when it came time that they realized, I can't hide him anymore, they said, let's do this. And they, built a, they basically took a basket and put pitch on it to make it waterproof. And they put him in the river, but they put him in this basket into the river. And this is where Miriam really comes on the scene. We actually have her mentioned here is in Exodus. We, we have Miriam talked about there in Exodus chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And I have that on the screen for you or in the live version. His sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Miriam had enough faith to stand back and watch what God was doing. And to me, that's the great first lesson. She showed a great faith. She stood aside with expectation of God's going to do something. She wanted to watch what happened to her baby brother. She wanted to, to, to be aware of what was going on. And I just see her as someone that displayed a lot of faith Trusting God to do something. And I just read into her story this faith that she had to have to see what happened to Moses. They, they had taken the faith. They put him on the water and, 
and had done more than just throw him in like the rest. And she had this expectation and she watched. And you know, that's a, that's a lesson for us because we too need to have faith. We need to have faith and expectation of what God can do. I admire missionaries and I, I, I've been there for a little bit. In fact, I've been in Baton Rouge as a missionary for a couple of years. And when Joel told us he was going to sell his house in California and move to Baton Rouge, I said, ooh, that's hard, especially in his circumstance. He's provided his own livelihood basically from the sale of his house from California. I went over there and there was already a salary guaranteed at least by the BMA of Louisiana. Says he's going in alone. Basically everything's going into the, to the new church. It takes faith to take those steps. It takes faith to reach out to the person you work next to and, and ask them about Jesus and to witness to them. It takes faith and trust in God to pray to Him in situations. To go to Him in prayer and ask Him. In fact, it's so important that Hebrews 11.1, 1, if I did this right, you can see it. Yeah, it's working. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith brings to reality those things we can't even see. We trust God. When we pray, it's because we have faith that God's going to do something. It starts at salvation. We can't get saved if we don't trust God. We trust what he said in his word that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we in faith reach out and call on his name. We repent and we ask him to be our savior because we trust what he says in his word. And it's by faith that that happens. Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace through faith. Faith is, is that step of salvation. Faith is where we go on down the, down the road in life though. Through faith, we see what can't be seen with the natural eye. We see that God can provide for us, no matter how desperate the situation looks. We see that God can protect us, no matter what's going on. And I, I'll let you judge for yourself on this illustration, whether it's an act of God that's a miracle or not. But the terrorists have been complaining recently. A couple of months ago, when they were raining rockets on Israel, they got mad. And they were interviewed and they said it's because the Israelites' God keeps re-messing up our missiles. They keep going the wrong spot. They're aiming to the heart of Tel Aviv and the missiles are going out toward the middle of a field where nobody's at. And the terrorists themselves said it had to be their God that did that because our missiles are reliable. Folks, the Bible says that's going to happen someday. In Ezekiel, it talks about a day that they're going to try to invade Israel and that God's going to wipe them out. out. God's going to push them out of the skies, off the ground. God's going to def defend Israel. Maybe we saw a little foretaste of it when their missiles. They didn't have to use their iron dome for a while because some of those missiles were aimed at, at non-populated areas because they launched them and then suddenly they veered off. We have to have faith God can protect us. That's why we stand up. That's why people still are going into places where they know they may get arrested for being a Christian and they're standing up for God because faith. They believe God can do this. Like Miriam, we need to look forward in expectation and anticipation to see what God's going to do. The next lesson we see from her, though, is we also need to be courageous. Miriam didn't just have faith. She, she acted on it with courage. And the rest of this story here in Exodus 2, it says, Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Now, put yourself in Miriam's shoes. She's a slave girl. This is Pharaoh's daughter, possibly the heir to the throne. She, women were Pharaoh's too. She could have ended up the next queen of the Nile. And she walks up to her and says, she heard Pharaoh's daughter say, it's a Hebrew child. Shall I go call a Hebrew woman? The Jewish story says basically none of the Egyptian nurses were able to quiet the child. And that's why she offered this. It's kind of an interesting push there, but it says, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. It took courage to approach her. I mean, think about it. You pick up this baby out of the river, you know it's a Hebrew child, and next thing this little Hebrew girl walks up to her and says, shall I go get you a Hebrew nurse? It doesn't take much brains to put two and two together, does it? This must be somehow related to this baby. 
They could have arrested her on the spot. Yeah, it's a conspiracy, isn't it? But Pharaoh's daughter had compassion. God had moved on her heart. She said, I'm going to take this baby as my own. And like the stories, I believe this is part where the fictional stories get, get it right. Moses could have ended up as heir to the throne because by Egyptian law, basically, you're adopted in the family, you're just like blood, and you could end up on the throne anyway. He, he could have gotten there. But it could have exposed the family. It took some courage to speak up. And then his, Moses' own mother, because of this courage, got to be Moses' nurse until the time he was weaned. And, and anything from two or three years old, possibly some people say that their custom would have been basically till he had gotten on up around 10 or 11, not just weaned, but able to think and go to Egyptian school and all that. So Moses had that because of Miriam's courage and, and because of, of, of her stand. And you know, it takes courage to please God. We've got to have faith, but sitting here in our heart saying, I believe, that's one thing. It takes courage then to act on that belief. It takes courage to step out and do those things God has called us to do. The phrase, have courage, I did a little search online. I didn't search every term related to this because it would have taken too long. But the phrase, have courage, appears 40 times in the Bible, in the New King James Version. It also matters which version you look at. The phrase, have no fear, appears 21 times. And something about being bold or with boldness is 35 times. And if we go through all the rest of the words, you see how over 100 times God told his people, be, be courageous, be bold, don't have fear. God wants us to have that courage. It takes courage in our witnessing to not just have faith, but to speak out on that faith. It takes courage to, to, to stand up for God and tell people about him. It takes courage to share the good news. It, it has to take courage because so many people don't do it, they say, because they're afraid. So many people won't speak out because they fear how the other person will react. So many people won't tell their friends and family because they're afraid they'll lose their friends and family if they tell them about God. But think, we're, we're accepting losing them for eternity over not letting them get mad at us right now. I think that we need to take a chance on offending them now to tell them God loves them now. Otherwise, we'll be separated for eternity later. It takes courage to tell our bosses about God. It takes courage, to, like some of the kids did this last week. It was see you at the poll Wednesday. It takes courage to show up at the flagpole in front of your school and to gather there with other Christians and pray. Not all the student body came in Wortham, which is where we were. And every place I've heard from, lots of kids came, but it wasn't 100% of the student body. In fact, it wasn't the majority of the student body. And it takes courage to stand up and be different from the majority. If you're doing what everybody else is doing, that's not a big deal. It's easy. That's the easy path. But you stand up and let them see you singing songs of praise to God and praying at a flagpole, you just paint a target on your back. Because you're now saying, I identify with and represent Jesus. And it takes courage to take those steps. It took courage Wednesday night at the revival meeting for... I'm estimating a hundred at least come down to the front and get saved of all ages because they responded to that gospel message. It took courage to step out in front of their friends. It takes courage to live for God. It takes courage to be different from the people around us in that we live by God's word, not by what the world says. More and more the standard of our culture and God's word are getting farther and farther apart. And it's not because God's changing. God gave us the Ten Commandments. They hadn't changed. Jesus just tightened them up a little bit by saying your attitude and your heart is the same thing as the action with your body. And so God's standard didn't change, but our society accepts more and more. That's in violation of God's Word. Our society is moving farther and farther away from what God said is right. And they're accepting wrong as right. And it takes courage to be the one to say, no, I'm not going to do those things. No, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm not going to participate in that. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to do those things. It takes courage to stand up and do that. Miriam was a great example just right here from Moses' beginning days by her great faith that she had and her great courage. And the next lesson I think we can see from her life is she also was a great example in giving God the glory. We turn a few, few passages over there to Exodus, 
And we see this, let's, let's set the scene here in Exodus chapter 15. God had sent, Mo, Moses had grown up. Moses at 40 had tried to deliver Israel. He killed an Egyptian who was beating an Israeli guy. And then the next day he tried to separate two Israeli guys that were fighting each other. And they said, what, are you going to kill us too? And then he got scared because knew, they knew about his deed. So he ran off to Midian and stayed there 40 years. God appears to Moses in a burning bush and says, Moses, go down and leave my people out. And by this time in 80, even though Moses had been trained in the court of Pharaoh, Moses probably knew all the Egyptian laws, may have been in line to be in the throne, at least if the right things and circumstances had happened. Now he was too scared to even go down and talk for God. He says, I'm slow of speech. I can't talk very well. So God said, take your brother Aaron. And we'll talk about Aaron some other time. Our focus really isn't, isn't Aaron this morning. And gives him these signs to do, like throwing his stick on the ground and becoming a snake and picking it back up. And uh, put his hand in his coat, pulling it out, it become leprous, put it back in and it's healed. He did these things to try to show and demonstrate the truth that God had sent him. And here we have Moses has talked for, for God. Moses has delivered the people. God sent the plagues on Egypt. And finally, Israel gets set free. And as they already have left, the Egyptians decide, because of Pharaoh's heart being hardened again, let's go get them. We can't let our slaves go. And so they send out their chariots, and Pharaoh's leading the chariots. And they basically have Israel trapped between the sea and the army of Pharaoh. And it looks desperate. And then God tells Moses, basically, Moses puts his staff out over the water, and the waters part. Egypt, Israel walks across on dry ground, and now they're set free from Egypt. Pharaoh sends his army in between these two walls of water, and then the walls close in, and Pharaoh's army gets drowned. And in Exodus 15 is where we have a praise service. Moses starts off just praising God, and the first part of Exodus 15 is a, a song Moses leads the people in giving God the glory, talking about how God had brought them out. And then we see Miriam in a leadership role there in verse 20. At 21 it says, Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Miriam led them in a response. So Moses has gone out and he has, he has talked about the glory of God. They have led the children of Israel singing it. And then Miriam is a worship leader of the women. They're out there dancing, playing the timbrel, which is a lot like the tambourine. And they're out there just praising God, responding to that. Miriam was a worship leader for them. She gave God the glory for delivering Israel. She and all of Israel should have known that only God could have done that. You can stand by water all day. Brent works next to a lake. Brent, have you ever walked up there and just asked the lake to part and you're able to walk across it on dry ground? If there's a drought, maybe. Then it's a bigger miracle because Pharaoh drowns them in, in uh, drought. Some people like to challenge exactly where it was. They said, well, maybe it wasn't such deep water. I said, that's fine. Israel went through ankle deep water. That's not what the Bible says. It was dry ground. So first of all, it did dry up for them. Then God manages to drown Pharaoh's army in ankle deep water. That's a bigger miracle in my book. The point is, God opened the water, let them go across on dry ground, then God closed it, destroying Pharaoh's army. And at that point, Pharaoh's got no option but to go home because they can't pursue Israel anymore. God had completely delivered them and Miriam led them in worship. And this is that lesson to apply. We need to give God the glory in all situations. We need to give the glory to God. Early catechisms, they used to teach, instead of Bible studies, they had catechisms to the kids. And they teach them certain basic doctrine, basic ideas from God's Word. But the very first thing they would ask is, what is the purpose of man? And, and bottom line, it was given to glorify God. Well, I thought I had the verse up there. You'll just have to let me read it to you. 1 Peter 4.11 says, Then in all things, God in all things may be glorified. That glory of God needs to be the thread that runs through all of our actions. That in our whole life we give glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says it this way, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. What is our purpose? It's to lift up God in this world. Our purpose is to glorify God every moment of every day. And Miriam was a great example of this. She led out all the women of Israel in this great praise service to what God had done. 
and it's so much of a leader. We don't have a lot of other details throughout the Exodus on Miriam's life, but so much of a leader, she had to play that role throughout the rest of it because in Micah, God says through the prophet Micah, Miriam was one of the three, along with her brothers Moses and Aaron, who led Israel out. She had a high role in leading them. She was probably the leader of the women, a lot of scholars agree. She probably handled the, the, the leadership of the women and the teaching of the women and, and, and helping them fulfill their mission and purpose in all this. Our purpose is to lift up God. One scholar said it this way, he said it'd be better if we would lose our own life than fail in that purpose. We need to see our lives as bringing glory to God and that needs to be that's why they asked, what is the chief end of man? It's to give God glory. That is our reason for being here. That is our purpose in life, to glorify God. At the end of our lives, may it be said of each of us, that they glorified God. Their lives pointed to God and gave glory to God. Like the song, to God be the glory. Should I gain any praise, let it, be, let it go to Calvary. That's the point. It's not about us. It's not about our skills and our talents and our money and our position and our wealth. It's about giving God the glory. Because it's only by His grace we have any of that stuff to begin with. We're nothing without the gift of God in our lives. Better to lose our life than to fail at giving God glory. Glorifying God respects all persons of the Trinity. It respects God the Father who gave us life. God the Son who gave His life for us. And God, the Holy Spirit, who produces new life in us. That's why the old doxology says, Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We must give glory to God. Now I would like to end right here. I wish we could stop right now. But unfortunately we can't. Because Miriam also set a bad example for us. The other time we find Miriam talked about is in Numbers chapter 12. And she teaches us the lesson to stay humble. In Numbers 12, well, I, didn't, I thought I had it done. My technology is failing me this morning. In Numbers 12, it says this, Then Miriam and Aram spoke against Moses because the Ethiopian woman whom he married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken to us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down on a pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. We're going to pause there a minute. We'll come back to, to Numbers 12. <coughs> did you see what Miriam did? Miriam and Aaron, first of all, they, they, they got mad. They got mad about some things and they attacked Moses. And now God's calling them down on the carpet about it. They, they grumbled, they complained. They complained about his Ethiopian wife that wasn't the children of Israel. Forget the fact that he'd gone out to the Midianites and lived there for, for eight, uh, 40 years. They, they used this as a reason to complain. And then they complained against Moses and they said, hasn't God also spoken to us? I hear a little bit of jealousy in that. And it says this, Hear now my words. This is the Lord speaking. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, for he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam, Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned to Miriam and, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If a father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterward she may be received again. God put judgment on them. God didn't, Miriam took the brunt of the judgment because Aaron was high priest and they didn't want the high priest taken out of being high priest. So Miriam had to become leprous on the spot because of what had gone on. I, 
the Bible doesn't say why they complained other than this wife. I think I see it a few things. First of all, I think jealousy had to be a part of it. Moses had gotten all the attention. Moses was the big leader. He was the head honcho. And so his older brother and sister got the same, wait a minute, baby brother's getting too big. It's time to bring baby brother down a little bit. And so they got jealous. And I also see in it, they were a little judgmental. They found a reason to accuse him and his wife. Now, there was no law that Moses had. First of all, the law wasn't given until God gave it to Moses halfway through the Exodus. It's about Exodus 20, we get the Ten Commandments come out. So there was no law that he had violated that said marry only other Israelite women. And even in the law, God had given Moses. It wasn't about ethnicity. It wasn't about nationality. It was about believing God or not believing God. Because even David, King David, who was of the bloodline of, of, of David, Jesus came out of David's bloodline. He was an ancestor to Mary and Joseph. And Mary, Jesus' blood comes through that. There were two Gentiles in Jesus' bloodline going into David. It was always a matter of faith. The New Testament even bears that out. It says, don't let a believer be not equally yoked with a non-believer. That's the only distinction given in God's word. Two types of people, the saved and the lost. The believers and the unbelievers. Sinners dying and going to hell and sinners that are saved by the grace of God. That's the only difference in the Bible that each of us stands up with. But they said, she's an Ethiopian. We don't like that. She's not a Hebrew lady. She didn't grow up the Hebrew way, so we don't like that. So even though there was no law, they used this as a, as a reason to complain. And I think in this we see and learn, we need to remain humble. If Miriam and Aaron had been satisfied with serving God, they had never done this. They'd have said, I'm fulfilling the role God's given me, and they never would complain against Moses. Instead, they got puffed up and too proud, too, too into their own benefit, and so they started complaining against Moses. And it cost them. Miriam was shamed. She, wore, she had to be a leper. If not corrected, she would have been outside the camp for the rest of her life. If not corrected, it would have been a short life because of the way leprosy works on the body. She couldn't feel anymore, and they ended up injuring themselves. They ended up getting infections and not know it, or just a small cut. They wouldn't know it was there and it ends up getting infected and cost them ultimately their lives many times. And so God said, basically after they repented, God said, okay, if her father had spit on her, it would have been seven days unclean, so she has to be unclean seven days. So for seven days she endured the shame of being a leper. And do you think in her mind she ever forgot those seven days of shame? Something like that will stick with you your whole life. Any serious illness will stick with you your whole life. But that shame, she probably learned a lesson, and we don't find her ever complaining again, so maybe she went to her grave serving God still. But folks, I think we need to understand that. We need to, be, we need to stay humble before God. It, it, we need to apply Hebrews 13, 17, which is only one place that says this, but it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. They that do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. We need to submit to those in authority over us. And in context, this is talking specifically about those in spiritual authority over us. Our parents, our, our, our spouse, our, the, 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 the elders in the church, the teachers. It's saying learn from them. Be open and learn. But the thing is, it, it, that just grinds on our nerves, doesn't it? To be told, submit. The problem is we've got this wrong idea that submission to someone's a bad thing. It's not. Not biblical submission. Not when we're carrying it out the way the Bible says to carry it out. Because ultimately, it says to every Christian, submit to each other. Everyone's got the right to come and say, Brother James, I think, think you're off on the Bible here. Let me show you this. Or Brother James, this is something I've learned. Let, let me teach you. Let me share with you what God's doing in my life. We're told because we're all priests. We all submit to each other and to each other's instruction. And when we're called to, to, to repent from sins, we can all hold each other accountable in that. And we need to do our job. Basically, through carrying out our ministry, we all play a part. Every one of us is important. I think of the church like this tripod. I use this when I'm videoing or I use this with the camera just to take pictures. 
Now you tell me which leg is unimportant on this tripod. If I decide this leg is unimportant, and I want to set up a good picture, that's what happens. Guess what? In the church, if we start thinking of ourselves as unimportant, or that person over there is unimportant, our church collapses. We can't do our job without everybody doing their job. So really, submitting is not a bad thing. There are some of you that can see needs better than anybody I've ever heard. You know when something's going on in someone's life, and you can call them on it in a loving way. Sometimes we call it nagging, but it's love. And it tells, you know, you guys, what's wrong, what's wrong? Nothing, nothing, I'm fine. Eventually, we have to be honest. And, you know, why fight it? Why not just say, yeah, I'm having a problem with this. Would you pray with me? Because they're doing it out of love. And they're using the gifts God's given them. Others have the gift that we have light here today. I thought it was a new building. I walked in and I can see my Bible on the pulpit. It's an awesome thing. But you didn't want me up there trying to change that, I guarantee you. I do good to walk across the ground without stumbling on something nowadays. I did fall coming home Monday and scratched my knee up. <coughs> it was a ADFL, attention deficit. Oh, flashy lights. Because there was a car fire across the street from the restaurant we were coming out of. I couldn't help it. I was attracted to watching putting out the fire and stumbled over the curb. We need each other. Some people are good at organizing what we do. Planning and organizing and putting the costs together. And Others have got the gift of giving. It takes all of us working together. Otherwise, I like this tripod. And really, truthfully, we probably should say two of the legs are probably God anyway. And all we supply is what we give through this one leg. That tripod works real well when you've got all three legs locked in. I thought about doing it with the camera, but then I said, I'll never catch it if I did that. There's no way. But you think about it. As a church, and church to church, sometimes we could be just as guilty of <coughs> getting jealous over other parts. We've all got to play our part. We're important as the next. We can't live without one part of the church. We need each other. Miriam has taught us some valuable lessons. She's taught us to have faith, to be courageous, to give God the glory, and to stay humble. Are we following her example? Are we doing our part in following her example to, to, to do what we're supposed to be doing? Are we trusting God every day? Are we courageous in carrying out our ministry for Him? Do we give Him the glory for anything that happens? And are we staying humble instead of letting our pride get in the way? Sometimes we're better at that than others. My prayer for us today is that we'll learn from Miriam's lesson and we'll apply it to our lives and follow him. Would you bow your heads as we prepare for a time of decision?